A warm welcome to the program. I'm Felicity Ezewiki. We have two conversations today. We'll start with the ECOWAS lifting of economic sanction. They've done this after imposing on the Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso. I mean, there are military coups there. The lifting of the sanctions followed long hours of deliberations by the regional leaders at an extraordinary summit on the political peace and security situation in the sub-region. Announcing ECOWAS solutions after their meeting, President of ECOWAS Commission, Dr. Umar Torre, said the body had suspended the closure of the land and air border to Niger and a no-fly zone of all commercial flights. He said they had also suspended the freezing of all financial transactions between ECOWAS states and Niger, including transactions relating to the bloc's central bank and the unfreezing of all of Niger's assets. Tory said the move was based on humanitarian considerations due to Lent and the approaching month of Ramadan. To speak on this, I'm joined by Dr. Wale Ojewale. He is the Regional Coordinator, Central African Institute for Security Studies, Dakar, Senegal. Thank you very much for joining us on One Slot. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start with the fact that ECOWAS have lifted the sanctions without actually achieving the objectives for which the action was taken. What's your thinking on the reasoning behind its decision to lift the sanctions, even when the situation in these countries remain unchanged? Thank you once more. Um, we need to quickly underscore the fact that um, uh, in this particular extraordinary situation, ECOWAS as a bloc has different options on the table with which they can approach the situation. One of them was uh, potential military intervention, which was uh, carefully considered, and there was a uh, public hopper against that move. And I think it was subsequently dropped. And then simultaneously, they have to apply sanction. Um, to probably see whether they were going to with them do the, the military administration, the military government in the country into order. I think to a large extent that has worked, uh, but not um, has not been able to produce the intended results. I think it probably the junta were going to relinquish power within the shortest time possible. And the last option, which is also very important and which I think has climaxed in the relaxation of the sanction, is actually a um, peaceful resolution of the conflict, dialogue to find an amicable grant with which they can engage the military administration. And the, uh, the objective of ECOWAS is just one, to facilitate uh, a quicker democratic transition in the country. But unfortunately, the sanctions, even though yielded some result, because I believe a lot has happened behind the scene in terms of troubleshooting, um, the junta were not going to yield to uh, relinquish power. And the potential, I mean, the consequence of that is that the sanction uh, is actually biting harder on the poor people in the region. And so if democracy is actually about people's welfare, I think the decision that ECOWAS has taken is in the interest of the poor people that have been bearing the direct brunt of the sanction placed on the countries. So uh, particularly the J in this regard. So I think it's a welcome development because it serves the interest of the larger population in the J. Uh, you say it's a welcome development, but th there is concern about the possibility of creating a precedence of further coups and instability, because if you take action and there is no um, um, no effect to that action taking, and then you pull back, as some are describing that this action possibly further weakens the the powers and the authority of the ECOWAS. What's your thinking on it? Yes, two wrongs don't make a right. Why we can continue to imagine? and flip the possibility of uh, maybe creating a precedent with this. I think ECOWAS is also thinking of how they can prove, um, safe, prove democracy from, from uh, military incursion through coups in the region. But we have to deal with the urgency of the matter at hand. I've had the privilege of interacting with people from Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso in two to three conferences in the recent time, particularly in Accra and here in Senegal, and even in, in Abuja. 
And the preponderance of the feedback that we have received from them is that uh, the sanctions are biting harder on the people in terms of livelihood security, in terms of um, even access to basic medicine. And don't forget that these countries are landlocked countries. Um, about the poorest of the poor in the region, if you look at the statistics of human development index globally, I think Niger is probably among the top bottom 10 um, out of almost over 194 countries. So this is the reality that ECOWAS is confronted with, and that uh, much as they, we need to think about uh, the future implication of this action, the urgency of the moment implies that they need to find a way to ameliorate the pains of the people. And beyond that is the fact that uh, it also offers a window of engagement with the junta in those places who have suspended democratic transition indefinitely in those countries. So um, I, I think the bulk of the work is with the ECOWAS to think about how this will not create a bad precedent. But as things stand, it doesn't look like the sanction was going to make the military juntas in those countries to budge in any way. Rather, they were creating alternative parts, creating defense parts, and then they went for the jugular by pulling out of ECOWAS, which is a very big deal for ECOWAS. So uh, I think the, the tax lies with ECOWAS to see how they can safe proof democracy in the region, but the urgency of the of now is the fact that uh, yeah, I, I will definitely be coming to you on the pulling out of these three bodies and the reasons that there, these are issues we'll try and cover. We'll get your thoughts on it. But let's look at the again. The decision to suspend these sanctions was based on humanitarian considerations, and you have said to open up peace talks, dialogue um, with not just Niger's military junta but others. Um, do you really see a dialogue taking place? Because this uh, sanction there doesn't seem to be all the talks we've heard has been deadlocked. How would this sanction, in real terms, translate to uh, better communication, better dialogue between uh, these parties? So um, I, I, I don't think um, the dialogues have end, uh, ended on um, um, on the note of. Uh, no solution in view. But uh, both, both parties are not shifting, really, are they? They are not shifting their position. The military, the junta has not decided, uh, has not said anything about transitioning to democracy. They've not given any dates, or, unless my information is incorrect. Yes, you know, there, um, there, there were possible windows originally. For instance, when the junta came into power in Niger, they said they were going to hand over power in 2027. Um, existing conversation between Mali, uh, Burkina Faso, and Guinea, uh, as earlier stipulated that they were going to exit by the end of December 2024. That is the upper limit of the duration. And then along the line, ECOWAS would, was not going to tolerate that uh, because, uh, for instance, in Mali is going to be about four years at the end of this year that. Uh, uh, in 2024, that they've had military incursion into politics in that country. So, um, and then you have Burkina Faso, that um, that transition was also supposed to take place by the end of this year. As a matter of fact, Mali agreed to hold election in 2024. Don't forget that President Gulo Jonathan was appointed by ECOWAS, and he was going to Mali frequently to uh, resolve this democratic transition issue in the country. But along the line, Burkina Faso also fell. And then the last one, Niger fell. And these people felt like, oh, we can create a, a bigger pact to speak, I mean, to negotiate on one grant. And these are the grants in which they were negotiating. For instance, the referendum that took place in Mali has provided amnesty for uh, Asim Iguita to put himself on the ballot. That is a serious democratic risk in which people come into power through the gun and suddenly they put themselves on the pallet. You've seen this happening in different places in Rwanda, Uganda, even in some part of Africa, in many part, in many countries in Africa. That is the big bad precedent that we're going to create, which I think ECOWAS is having a pushback. And then now that Mali has set that precedent, if ECOWAS is not putting a strong foot on the ground, what they are going to do is that they want to have a situation in which whatsoever ECOWAS permits in one country, he must permit in another places. 
And that is the really bad precedent that could be created in this sense. So there were some agreements along the line. At the moment, they, pulled, they, they went for the jugular by pulling out of ECOWAS. The implication is that they foreclosed the door to ECOWAS to even negotiate for democratic transition in that in those countries. And this could have a serious neighborhood effect in the country. I think this is what has pushed ECOWAS to, to the extreme to begin to also tinker with the idea of relaxation of the of the uh, of this of the sanction in those countries. So these are the realities in terms of what ECOWAS has been dealing with in those countries. Don't also forget that uh, General Yakubu Gowon is the funding father with Nasimbe Yadema many years ago of ECOWAS um, uh, in the region, and he has actually approached the chairman of the ECOWAS uh, in, in person of the president of Nigeria to say, this generation is not going to forgive you, and the for future generation is going to not going to forgive the present court of leaders of ECOWAS if they see to the death of ECOWAS. So these are some of the soft diplomatic engagement that took place behind the scene and that made ECOWAS to come to the realization that they need to actually relax the, the sanction. Uh, um, believe... On the flip side, I mean, if, if I get you correctly, uh, the move by these three countries to create a separate body for themselves also influenced ECOWAS' decision to relax some of the sanctions. It, that let me get that. Is, that. is that the correct interpretation of what you just said? Yes, that is the biggest, the, the biggest, the master stroke in their hand. So th that means these people, n not to encourage it, but it seems cunning in a way. It seems like a win for them. It, and again, it goes back to what I said earlier about authority and leadership. Some are saying that these actions that are being taken by ECOWAS further weakens um, um, it, it's, um, its power in the, in the, in the continent. It's, uh, they're saying that the, the benefits, they're urging now that these three uh, um, countries should please reconsider their decision to leave the member state. It's been described as weak and whiny. That's what a lot, um, some analysts are saying. Is that too rash a criticism of ECOWAS? And um, what are the implications of these kinds of decisions? Because in a way, if, if you've accepted that that is one of the reasons that ECOWAS has decided to... Um, relax it, it emboldens these people. Don't you think so? So this is what you do in this situation. Well, we first need to connect this development to what has happened about four years ago. The real failure on the part of ECOWAS is that when Mali fell in 2020, ECOWAS did not act decisively in dealing with Mali. So that situation created a precedent for Burkina Faso to also fall. So, and then you suddenly wake up when the JFL to say, oh, we're going to engage with military intervention. If they have heap sufficient sanction on Mali, it will have served as a deterrence for Burkina Faso's uh, military adventurists and politics to have weighed their option. By the time they will have seen the suffering that Mali has been subjected to as a country. Now that this whole card has fallen now, it is now left to ECOWAS to begin to rethink um, strategies that will ensure that they manage this little, I mean, this court of three countries. Now, don't forget that even though Guinea uh, Conakry is also part of this, but he has been running a different program uh, for himself in time to satisfy the interest of different the uh, divergent actor, so to speak. So we're focusing on these three countries. So now the situation that ECOWAS is confronted with is how do they use all the tools at their disposal, threat of military intervention, sanction, and peaceful resolution of conflict, combining these three factors together now to be able to bring these people back into the fold. And when what you do is that uh, with that now, they ensure that they safe proof democracy in other countries, just that, so that, that there is no repetition of these uh, in the future, uh, I mean, in the years to come. Yes, this is the preponderance of the concern of most people, that if you condone this now, other countries may fall. Yes, I think those exist in the realm of people's imagination, but we have to deal with what we have at hand now. And I'm persuaded that the way that ECOWAS has gone about it, particularly in the recent time, by listening to the preponderance of opinion of people is actually the right way to go. Most people who sit on the other side of the argument who say, oh, you threaten military intervention, you didn't carry it out. You also relax your sanction. The question I, ask for, I, mean, I have for them is that, are they just waking up to the reality of the potential humanitarian consequence of military intervention in those countries? 
or do they think ECOWAS can actually um, uh, restore democracy by force? We has that happened. It may almost 20 years in Afghanistan. America still had to pull out with all the resources and the money that they expended in that country. Oh, so uh, why should you go the route of something that? An intriguing question comes to mind as you speak, and that is the three countries that we're talking about lifting sanctions from, are they truly interested in the moves that has been taken by ECOWAS? Yes, there were some implications to the sanctions for the citizens of these countries, but are the leaders really interested in it? Because they seem to have moved on. They have used that opportunity to dig into themselves and find alternative um, uh, to what ECOWAS provide for them. So, in the long run, does it really mean anything? Are these people interested in whether ECOWAS uh, relaxes the sanction or not? Yes, I'm very sure they are keenly interested. The economy of Niger, for instance, relies heavily on Nigeria. We supply electricity to them. The same thing with uh, what you have in Mali and Burkina Faso. Uh, pre, um, a greater percentage of the imports that goes into Burkina Faso goes through Ghana. Don't forget that there are landlord countries that have already been blocked from access to the sea. These are some of the realities that are really biting harder on them. And they do not have so much option. I think the drama, the charade, and the shenanigans that they've created in the recent time is to put ECOWAS in an uncomfortable situation. And I think they have played the, 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 their last card now by attempting to pull out of ECOWAS. So it is in their own interest and the interest of their citizens to come back to the fold. Because, look, for instance, Burkina Faso has more than 80 staff working in ECOWAS. What is going to become the realities of those people? How long is ECOWAS going to tolerate paying their salaries when their country is not making any contribution? And that is even a minute factor. The big factor here is that people are really hungry. They are hungry with ECOWAS. And the country, the, 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 the military junta in those countries are also not making significant progress. In all human development indication, uh, security, health, education, public safety and securities, those countries have actually retrogressed significantly in the past two years. So what are we seeing here? They should know, and I believe they know, that they are running on borrowed time. And there is a limit to which the citizens collectively are going to tolerate their stay in power. So uh, I think it is in their own interest that they come back to the fold now and then uh, begin to expedite democratic transition, which is the final objective of ECOWAS and what the people, what is um, the journeys of the people in those countries. I mean, not, not, uh, to, not to keep putting that, you... Uh, yeah. Not to keep putting you on the spot, but one thing is to make call. The other thing is for people to actually listen and take heed. This announcement was made on Saturday, and ECOWAS is asking, as it has been asking for a while, for the immediate release of former uh, President Bazoum, and also called for transition um, authorities in Niger to provide an acceptable transition timetable uh, for constitutional order again. How will this work without leverage? What is ECOWAS using now to encourage this dialogue? Is it uh, lifting sanctions? Yes, it, it, when you say it, it's impacted on these people, not just them, it also impacted on the originating countries like Nigeria, for instance. Yes, um, you know, uh, and we also need to underscore the fact that sanctions were not just lifted even though ECOWAS said on the humanitarian grant and all those things. Sanctions were lifted because that has been the preoccupation of the military junta in those countries to say, yes, we are going to do what you are asking for. We are going to expedite democratic transition, but leave the sanction that you imposed on us. Leave the sanction that you, sanction that you imposed on us. Now ECOWAS has lifted the sanction. It is now the ball in their own courts now to also play by the rules of the game. Because if they refuse to do that, then a higher blood is going to fall on them. And then it's going to put them in a perpetual state of paria state that is going to be completely inconvenient for them and for the entire citizenry of the country. Um, we are talking about ECOWAS here. Don't forget that there are also other big stakeholders in the region. For instance, you're talking about what is the France interest in the region? What is the U.S. interest in the region? What is the United Nations interest in the region? AU is going to play a role. These are a whole lot of different actors with bigger levers who are going to prevail on them to say they've lifted the sanction now. Then it is for you to now expedite the democratic transition in those, I mean, your countries. The lifting of the sanction isn't the sole desire or um, drive of ECOWAS. It is the 
big issue, the big factor in the negotiation on the part of the juntas in those countries. And ECOWAS has now met that expectation. And by meeting them at the midpoint, and I believe it's also left to them to now take heed to the negotiation on the part of ECOWAS in terms of their demand. And then everybody can jolly together, if you permit me to use that word. <laughs> What would be an ideal time frame um, for us to begin to hear? Or maybe in your circles, you're already hearing that the juntas are making moves of a choice to actually have these conversations with ECOWAS. I guess I'm asking, what would be a time frame that will begin to see results? Is it one week? Is it two weeks? Um, is it a month? You, by that, you are asking when we begin to hear from them that they are also... That there is, the uh, there is even a conversation going on, a negotiation, talks about restoring, if not restoring constitutional uh, um, um, uh, democracy, but maybe talks about re more human rights for these people in these countries. Yes, I can assure you that uh, conversation is going on, negotiation is going on. A lot of troubleshooting is going on. Not everything makes it to the pages of the newspaper or TV shows like we're talking. But um, in terms of um, yielding to um, democratic transition in those countries, I don't think ECOWAS is going to tolerate anything beyond 18 to 24 months. Because the, the longer you allow them to stay, the more they entrench themselves in the system, the more they consolidate power and the more they begin to come up with uh, unrealistic expectations and demand. The big picture, which I think ECOWAS want to foster in this country, not to create a bad precedent, like I said earlier, is to allow these people to come on the ballot. And I think Mali was ready for even election in February before Nijay fell, and they suddenly realized that I think the number is increasing in the neighborhood. Let us see how we can further create some fracture and then uh, become act, acting a bit uh, rational in their own interest. And that is what actually happened. Mali was on the path to facilitating election until they were able to recruit additional um, autocrats or, or, or military authoritarian into the fold. And then they suddenly realized that they can create um, their own trade union of authoritarian, uh, their own authoritarian union in the region. And then okay. in terms of immediate a response on the part of the people or the part of the government to probably say we are reconsidering our action we are coming back into the fold uh, where we continue to watch events in the coming days but uh, i believe within three to the, the next three to four months they should communicate their intent and the direction that they want to follow uh, as far as this is concerned but i'm one of the few optimistic people out there that believe that they are going to reconsider their steps because they are better served with ECOWAS as a block than creating all these um, uh, sporadic organizations yeah, here uh, and there that uh, they probably don't even have the fund to manage. I want to explore something you said earlier. I hope I can uh, link it uh, properly. You said that um, lifting the sanctions was one of the um, requests of these junters for them to come to the table. Now that that has been done, how do you think um, the action will influence uh, political dynamics in these countries, will the people also have a role, uh, something to say um, as regards the decisions that the junta will be taking in the coming days? Uh, can they do anything to expedite action um, um, on the part of the junta? I, I can confirm to you authoritatively that the honeymoon is over in those countries. Uh, 24 hours after the coup, the people you see hoisting Russia flag and jubilating and all those play, all those things that the theatrics that they put up are in big suffering now. Their voices have been taken away from them. The civil liberty of right of expression, right of to freedom of association and all those things have been taken away from them in Mali, in Burkina Faso and Niger. In fact, dissenting voices in Burkina Faso are arrested and posted to war front with terrorists in Niger, uh, journalists, the guide of journalists, whatever they call it, like the NUJ in Nigeria, has been suspended. They can, they've gone underground in terms of whatever work that they can do. In Mali, a woman did and uh, complain about cost of living and everything, and it went viral on on TikTok. And the woman was arrested, and I mean, maybe uh, human rights uh, abuse and all those things. These are the realities that people are living with in those countries. Now that ECOWAS has shifted, you will begin to see the voices of the civil society 
on the global scene, locally and internationally, you begin to see political parties, which they have actually been doing in terms of expedited transition in those countries. I'm privileged to know that by the virtue of my work. So I believe there will be internal pressure now on the junta in those countries to say, now ECOWAS has yielded. Now you also need to put up your timetable for democratic transition. Yeah. And I, I believe the, co the coalition of these voices is going to prevail on them. But right. let's not be deceived. People are not finding it. They are not, the life has become difficult for people uh, socially and economically and politically in those countries. I mean, that and is without question. Are not I mean, between any, any, uh, any governance to them. Anyone that monitors the uh, situation across the continent will see how biting it really is uh, for a lot of people. We're wrapping up, but there is something I'd like to um, hear your unique perspective. Just, uh, it's not away from the conversation, but it's still within it, and that's about constitutional order. Uh, I'm going to quote an excerpt from a business day that I read. Um, I, I would like your view in closing. At its inception in 1975, 8% of the signatory nations of ECOWAS were under military rule. The narrative of civilian control as the only acceptable framework in West Africa did not sound convincing. Is ECOWAS back to Alexander Pope's couplet, for forms of government let fools contest, whatever is best administered is best. In a contest of reimagining um, its approach to constitutional order. I want to ask your perspective on it. Well, um, it, it sounds like a poetic rendering, but uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the people, and it's fit into the larger conversation of people saying, oh, a, go a democracy that cannot put food on the table is not a democracy, and all those things. I, I think what we need to quickly underscore is that from 1975 to now, that is more than five decades, about about five decades ago. That's a very long time. The world has evolved. Um, we've gone through the Cold War period. We come to um, the third wave of democratization across the world, and then um, even West Africa started to democratize. So a lot has changed, and we cannot begin to operate with the playbook of what happened in 1975. That is the one thing. The second thing is that the reality now is that we cannot continue to view democracy and military authoritarianism as, op as opposite of each other. No, 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 no. There's no basis in terms of the present reality to even contemplate it at all. Because some people cannot just come to seize power because they have control or access to gun. That is what military authoritarianism actually does. It takes the people's right to, de to determine how they are going to be governed away from them. And the 21st century political development is not going to tolerate that, particularly in terms of the enlightened um, uh, interest that citizens now hold as far as their uh, gov as gov government is concerned in their country. And the second thing is that what separates democracy from military authoritarianism and civil liberty is not about putting food on the table. It's not about have, uh, good hospitals and roads. Military government, for instance, in Nigeria and Ghana, they put up those structures and they did that. But they took the software of, go of democracy away from the people, which is the right to determine how they are going to govern themselves through popular contests, inclusive uh, election, and whatever you have in that means. So the reality now is that we cannot continue to gravitate in that direction of seeing military authoritarianism as alternative to democracy. The world has evolved. Is now at, uh, is the, is no longer in fashion. Is no longer in the uh, contemporary. And then it has to be put where it belongs. Now the big deal is that the people must own democracy. They must participate in it, and they must lend their voice. That is what you saw in Senegal recently. Still, they have pushed the president to the limit to the extent that he had now the, the purported total ambition was perished because of people's resistance. And to the extent now that he's now saying that he's going to live by every second, this is what needs to be replicated across the region, where people actually have stronger voice and they can determine their own democratic destiny, not interrupting I hate to in and disruptions here and there. I hate to interrupt you uh, because I, I was really enjoying your submission, but we're out of time for this part of the conversation. So I'll say thank you very much, Doctor, for the insights you provided for us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.